Hey there boys and girls of the YouTube world, today the Dub Dog and I are going to take my 1964 Chevrolet Impala station wagon and give her a new lease on life. And by that, I mean disc brake upgrade and rebuild the entire front end. So I've had this car since 1999. This was the car that started everything for me. Well, maybe. It was, it was my first old car. Uh, I think I paid $875 for this thing in 1999. Like I said, I was just a wee little lad. I was at an auction sale in my hometown uh, and standing next to my grandfather, who I used to go to auction sales with all the time. And I remember bidding on this thing, and it got up to $875. bucks. i am like, Grandpa, I don't, I don't have any more money. He's like, I'll spot you. And the other guy we were bidding against, he's still in the business of car jockeying, and he's like, if he's bidding, it's worth it. So we kept bidding. Anyway, long story short, I bought this thing. It's had a couple changes over the years. This was my first will it run. It's got a 250 horse, 327 from the factory, factory dual exhaust, factory power steering, factory tilt wheel, factory power brakes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty well optioned. It doesn't have like AC, cruise, power seats, power windows. It does have a rear power window. It is a six passenger, not a nine passenger, so pretty well equipped. Uh, this thing was stuck, got it loose, hooked it up 24 volts, got her running. Uh, redid the carburetor, redid the power glide. This thing would burn like a quart of oil every 100 miles, something like that back in the day. So I put new exhaust on it. Um, in high school, I rebuilt the engine. So the drivetrain's pretty much all new. I've never touched the rear end. Knock on wood. I put one ball joint in it at one point. And the last time you guys saw this thing, I don't know why, but for some reason we pulled the engine out. Maybe it's because it's leaking oil profusely, but this engine's probably only got 15,000 miles on it. And we found that uh, there was a timing tooth missing and a few other things. And of course, I was just an 18 year old kid when I put that engine together. So, solved that. I drove that thing actually to this new property where we're at now. I can't remember if I just bought it or if I was in the process of buying it. But anyway, that was kind of one of the last trips it made. And then I drove it back home. And then I drove it here when I moved here. And every time I would hit the brakes, like, I feel like the right front wheel, this is like a year and a half, almost two years ago was gonna fall off. So it needs a complete front end rebuild. I did put Air Ride, it wasn't Air Ride Technologies, I think it was just Air Ride. No, it was Air Ride Technologies back then, now it is Ride Tech. Put a complete Air Ride in this thing, rubbed through a bag in the rear, so now it's back to the coil springs. I never had a compressor on it, so it's just bags in the front. I had red rally wheels on it from the beginning with white letters out, yeah, pretty terrible life decision. And then I put these 14 inch mismatched, uh, Five spokes on there, they're like an American knockoff. I think a couple of them are actually Unilug. And these, uh, they're like a BF Goodrich radial white wall. It was all used stuff I had around. It was cheap at the time, so I, I just can piece this car together. It's been my daily, a handful of summers, but it's been sitting for the last few years, probably four or five years. I haven't hardly driven it. So we're gonna rebuild that front end. The brakes have always been, they've been good, but it's pulled really hard. And I probably just need to adjust the brakes, but. I want to put discs on it to help it stop. And I don't know if those discs are going to clear these 14 inch wheels. So I actually had black steelies and center caps for this thing. And then I think they ended up going on the 61 Impala. And then I think they moved to the 56 Chevy two door post and they're probably on Reggie now. I don't know, but we'll find some other ones if we got to, but I think steelies would be pretty cool on this thing. The biggest thing is these tires are 20 plus years old. Like I said, I got them used and I don't want them to give us issues down the road and take out a quarter panel or something like that. So they just, and then it's, it's just a quick refresh. 20 bolts give her a whole different look. Uh, and then we also got drop spindles because the bags, it's always been soft up front. So I figure if we put a drop spindle and put more pressure in the bag, maybe it'll ride better. I don't know. Uh, long term, it's either got to go back to a coil spring or I need to put some type of uh, air management system so we can adjust it up and down and have onboard air and all that. So enough rambling. Oh, we got we got new swag with this car on it and the Duff. More great art by Mike Yaps. He's the man to go to for me. It's got the wagon. It's probably a little different with some new wheels on it, but get your merch. Morski.com. We got ball caps. We got hoodies. We got magnetic koozies. We got magnetic screwdrivers. We got super scrapers on hand. Limited amount. Hurry up. Get them. They go fast. We got banners. We got decals. What else we got? We got church keys. We got matchbooks. You name it. We got it. If we don't got it, 
You don't need it. Mortski.com. So yeah, buying merch helps me pay for stupid stuff like this. So this is a kit from Auto City Classics out of Isanti, Minnesota, not a paid promotion. It's, these guys are the cheapest. And so these are just GM metric calipers. These are some reproduced rotors. I'm guessing metric, they're drilled and slotted. Yay, it's gonna stop so good. Uh, they give you some, this is all Chinese stuff, Chinese bearings, seals, but if you wanted to upgrade down the road, you can at least get parts for this. You can go to a parts store and you can get metric calipers or a rotor or wheel bearings, all that. I don't like these small boosters and I did put a booster on this thing in high school. All these brakes were new when I got this thing going, by the way, so 25 years ago. But I like the bigger booster and they, and they fit better. So if, if this master, which is a Corvette style master, will bolt up to my booster, I'm gonna leave my booster because I don't like these little tiny ones. They look silly and in my opinion, they don't stop as well. Uh, these are the drop spindles. I think these are a two inch drop spindle or a two and a half inch drop spindle. And then I got all new Moog front end parts. The tie rod ends and the ball joints. I, Moog has been the go-to for me forever, but things have kind of changed. The tie rod ends and the ball joints, like I said, one of these ball joints are probably not gonna put in because one can have more than a handful of miles on it, are made in America. These bushings for the control arms, are India and Mexico, and this idler arm is America. So the majority of them are American parts, and then these bushings, they're just rubber and a little bit of steel. So there's no machine tight tolerance fit, so I'm fine with that being India and Mexico. So still pretty good stuff, but buyer beware, not everything's made in America like it used to be, unfortunately. There's a couple other things I'd like to straighten that balance. Um, we'll find things as we go. I think it had a rattle in the exhaust. It might need some mufflers. A few things here and there, but overall, it's a really, really, really dry car. There's a little rust there. I think uh, that's pretty common. There's a little dinger there. There's a little bit of rust in front of the wheels, and then the dog legs up front behind the uh, front wheels. That's super typical, and it needs clean. Like I said, air ride technologies back in the day, they were uh, ride tech now, I believe. Took the rough rack off. I hacked up the dash and put a Pioneer CD player in it because I was a kid. Uh, I took some, took the back floors out and put subs in it at one point. I put the floors back in and now I need to find the hinges and I can't find them. And so I don't know where those went, so we might be looking for those. It's got an electric window that always did work. And now it doesn't want to work, so I'm gonna have to look into that. Just a handful of things. So the neat history on this car is it's sold new in Duluth, Minnesota. The gentleman that I got it from his estate uh, he bought it at Muscatel in Fargo. I've got the paperwork somewhere. I got the original build sheet for this thing. It was like 3,700 bucks and change back in the day. But seatbelt delete option, it was like a $11 credit or something like that. But anyway, so I'm the third owner of this thing. Like I said, I've had it for 25 years. So I think it's pretty safe to say that I've owned this car longer than anybody else. The guy who had it before me, he drove it for a handful of years and then he stored his cat food inside of it. So. Yeah, there you go. It kept the mice out. This guy had a lot of cats. He was a different individual. But anywho, let's get this thing up in the air and let's start uh, ripping that front end apart. I might paint the calipers because you can see them. The spindles are already painted. Uh, the rotors look like they're coated, so they're not gonna rust. But like control arms, we're just gonna whammy the ball joints and bushings out and stick it back together because the rest of the frame is rusty. The rest of this car is rusty and I just want to drive it. If you start cleaning up control arms and painting and tubular in and all this stuff and smoothing them out and there's dings in them from driving a low car on gravel for 25 years and a 16 year old kid beating on it like I did. So it's, it's not perfect and I don't want it to be perfect. I just want to drive the crap out of it like I used to do. So, if you're here to see a restoration, you're about to be disappointed. You're probably gonna be disappointed in whatever you came here to see. But anyway, I'm gonna get my 64 Impala back on the road. So let's get this thing up on the lift, take a look at the bottom side. Cause I don't think you guys have ever seen the bottom of this car cause we were in the old shop when I worked on it back in the day. We lost that shop, so now we're in the new shop. So let's get this thing up in the air and take a look at the bottom side.
Tell you what, these low cars are no fun to get on the lift. You gotta use the jack to lift up one side because the jack won't go in the middle because it's so freaking low. I could have pumped up the bags, but they see you're not supposed to let the bags hang down when they got pressure in them, so. And that's the other thing about these bags, or bags in general, is they leak. I don't care how good you seal them up. They're gonna have slow leaks. So, let's take a look at the bottom of this low car. I wonder which, I feel like it was one of these ball joints we did. You can see the uh, whole Firestone airbag there. Doesn't look like a lower we did. That's still got the rivets in it. This is definitely the one we did. It's got bolts in it instead of rivets. So there you go, I was way off. Like I said, drum brakes. I gotta put a sway bar. <laughs> Never mind, it's on it. I just need to put end links on it, apparently. I just love this thing. Fresh engine, and it's it's leaking, not fresh yet. Well, I mean, freshly resealed. There's something leaking there out of the fuel pump. It looks like oil. These uh, Ram Assist steering units uh, leave a lot to be desired. I've never put hoses on this thing. We're just rolling the dice here. I see a nice puddle back there, so we'll have to check that out. I figured it would be the power steering because this thing's gonna give up one of these days. I'd like to convert it to a 605 box, like uh, we put on the 63 Impala. And then this is the power steering kit. Uh, this is a CPP brand. It uses their 500 series uh, metric GM box. But it's just not in the budget right now, and it, and it doesn't leak that bad, and it, and it works really, really well. I put a new radiator in it. I think I was in college when I did that. Yeah, we got a pretty major oil leak back here. What's it coming down the valve cover? Or who knows, but pretty good puddle there. So, I think I put a front seal in the tranny when we had it apart, I surely hope so. Oh, it might be that adapter right there that's leaking. This thing had a canister style filter, switched to a spin-on style filter. So, that might be our leak, but let's get the wheels off, get these control arms off. The original shocks, used to run through the center here. And so they sell this relocation kit and it looks like it's killing the bushings and those things, unfortunately. But yeah, then we'll be getting rid of the hoses, the brakes, the spindles, all that. Rebuilding these with new bushings, front and rear, new ball joints, same deal with the upper control arms. Of course, this is our lower control arm. It's got two bushings and a ball joint, upper control arm, same deal, two bushings and a ball joint. But yeah, I thought the cross member, oh, you could see it's it's pretty shiny <laughs> from hitting things. The control arms aren't as folded in as I thought. The exhaust just would get beat with gravel. The side's actually smashed in pretty good. Uh, Tim Simon down in Webster, South Dakota, Webster Auto Care, did this exhaust probably in about 2000, 2001. And it's holding up good. I remember the muffler started rattling one year, probably the last year I took it back to the 50s, so I just screwed a plate to it. Something must be let loose on the inside, so we gotta put some more, some new thrush turbos on there. Uh, I think I redid the U-joints and the hanger bearing in high school, and then I suppose when I put the bags on it, I put these, oh yeah, those are air ride shocks. I should probably put bushings and all this stuff at some point. Oh yeah, you can see that. We're gonna need a track bar bushing. She's, uh, you can see the rust coming out. She's metal on metal in there somewhere. So a good thing we checked it out. And actually I feel like there was a track bar kit in that uh, bunch of stuff I got. So maybe I knew about this. Maybe I didn't, we may never know. Here's the old air ride wine from back in the day. Okay. Let's get after it. Ah, there is a little bit of rust in this one body mount. See, the one on the passenger side, super solid. Well, there's a little bit of rust there. Not bad. But this side is kind of Swiss cheesy. And then one of the floors was a little bit soft, I thought I remember. No, maybe not. This car is overall super, super, super nice. I'm, I didn't know any better back then, but I got a good one. And that, unfortunately, doesn't happen very often for us. Someday I'd like to get rid of this rear end. These things are notorious for bearings and axle failure and bad things happening. They're just overall pretty weak rear ends. So maybe someday we'll get a quick performance nine inch and we'll 
rebuild all this stuff and maybe put air ride in it that time i don't know but i think it's probably like a 308 gear just shooting in the dark maybe a 336 we may never know so i could look at the build sheet but let's get some wheels off let's get some front end parts in this thing and maybe we can figure out why it was so uh terrible riding not riding where that it sounded like a wheel was gonna fall off I really like these uh, Wiley X sunglasses. Oh, one of you subscribers is an optometrist or works in the optometry world and reached out and uh, hooked us up. So I got two pairs of them, or I had two pairs of them, and uh, I've been missing one for like a year. Look what I found in the core support. I must have uh, taken them off my head and set them on the radiator when I was getting this thing running in the dark or something or I don't know but I found them hopefully they aren't all scratched to crap and they should be sweet those are like $300 score there so these are an ET wheel you can tell by the way that they are because of the way it is and they are a unilug or multi-lug pattern so you can see you just change these washers out these are four and three quarter bolt patterns, so you can get an offset washer and then that will either fit four and a half or five inch. One thing to look for on these wheels, I try to avoid unilugs now, but these were all I could afford back then. Uh, the center caps, they got steel screws going into aluminum and they like to break off. And so these ones have been broken off and then somebody rotated it ever so slightly and put some new holes in it. So that's one thing to look for. And then there's a two piece wheel where it's half steel and half aluminum. I wonder if the rears are like that. I try to avoid those because how do you mate steel and aluminum? Actually, I think it's a, a steel hoop with just an aluminum face, but either way, I don't like those. If you do find a set, don't pay much money for them. And on the rear, I'm not sure what brand these are. I'm guessing they're 14 by sixes or sevens all the way around, but same deal on the back. Uh, these got a bunch of studs snapped off because nobody put the anti-sneeze on them. And then these ones use a flat washer. Some use a conical taper bushing, taper seat. You know what I'm talking about. Conical style lug nut and a tapered seat. Uh, these ones use the flat washer style, so. These will make a good roller for something. They're uh, 215, 7014s all the way around. And they're uh, BF Goodrich Silvertone radials. These are expensive tires. They got a lot of tread in them, but like I said, they're they're freaking old. I do like the uh, dirty mag look. I like the dirty everything look, but I wash the car a few times, but I rarely wash the wheels and I have never cleaned the white walls because I like the way that she looks dirty. All right, you dirty girl. I take it all, you dirty girl. All right, we're going too far. I need to stop talking to this thing or I'm going to get uh, canceled. Let's get these wheels off. We interrupt your regular scheduled shenanigans to bring you this week's Mortski Minute. This week's Mortski Minute is brought to you none other than Mortski.com. Go check out Mortski.com for your best swag. We got ball caps. We got hoodies. We got beanies. We got magnetic screwdrivers, we got magnetic can koozies, we got decals, we got banners, we got the do banners in stock, we got the station wagon shirts in stock, get them now before they uh, fly off the shelf, and we got everything, if we don't got it, you don't need it. This week's Morsky Minute is brought to you from the Impala 6 Passenger Suite. This week's Morsky Minute is E.T., so where does ET wheels come from? ET wheels started as the Wheel Center Company, which was established in 1962 by Dick Beath. Dick Beath was a school teacher, not just any school teacher. He was a shop class teacher and he was also a land speed racer. Dick Beath? Uh, Dick, where are you from? I'm from Concord, California. Uh, what's your occupation, Dick? I'm a school teacher, uh, high school shop teacher. He was at the Santa Clara High School he developed the ET wheels in 1960. 1962 is when Wheel Center Company came to be, and that is uh, where ET wheel originally evolved from. The first design was a five-spoke design, similar to my favorite wheels, the American Racing Torque Thrust wheel. These original wheels were magnesium, which is super cool. I need to give me some magnesium wheels, but uh, I'm not gonna be knocking off a bank anytime soon. So that's where mag wheels comes from, is magnesium. And uh, 
they were a, a multi-piece design. Later on, ET was a huge innovator, and they were actually the first company to develop the Unilug bolt pattern. So the beauty of this Unilug design was that a dealer or ET manufacturing these wheels, they could make one wheel that could fit multiple applications. They could fit a Ford, AMC, Mopar, they could fit Chevrolet small cars, Chevrolet big cars, and dealers only had to have one wheel on hand. And this also cut down on manufacturing costs, so they pass these on to their dealers who pass it on to the customers who got a lower cost wheel. ET was also an innovator that they had the first one piece aluminum wheel offered. So these guys were, were pretty cutting edge at the time. Speaking of cutting edge, going back to Dick Beef, Dick Beef being a land speed racer. He was a land speed racer and uh, not only an innovator and that's where he came from developing these wheels and from the shop class that he was uh, sand casting parts but he was a land speed racer and he was racing volkswagens so he actually held some records at one point i'm not sure if he still owns them he was wait racing well into the 2000s and one of the things that he was racing was a streamliner that had a 44 cubic inch mercury outboard engine in it so unfortunately dick doesn't own et anymore et's kind of been uh passed around a little bit so in 1972 it was sold to lee filters was actually absorbed by Kelsey Hayes, a big wheel manufacturer, in the 1980s. Uh, by the late 1980s, ET was essentially dead. Then in the mid-90s, Dick actually restarted ET wheels and in 1999 sold it to Scott Russell and Team 3. The funny thing is, Scott Russell's father was actually Dick's high school teacher who got him talked into being a high school teacher, so it uh, kind of came full circle multiple times. Like I said, Dick owned the company twice. And then also Scott's father taught Dick. So there's a lot of history going on there. Um, so again, Scott Russell and his team, uh, team three is still creating and providing new ET wheels. So go and check those guys out. Now we couldn't just talk about ET wheels. We got to talk about my favorite wheels, the American racing wheel. American racing company was established in 1956 by drag racing innovator, Romeo, Palamides. Palamides? I don't know. Romeo. Primarily these were mag wheels that they were offering then and again Romeo was a racer but he was more of a drag racer. So 1963 the simple, stylish, sexy, lightweight, go fast, amazing universal wheel the torque thrust was released and it has been a staple in the industry ever since. Power Rod Magazine named the Torque Thrust one of the top 20 influential speed parts to the entire hot rodding industry. That's how important Hot Rod Magazine thinks that the Torque Thrust is. Almost as important as I think it is. American Racing Wheels have been a big part of the big screen too. They started in the movie Bullet. The Duke's a Hazard, if you're not familiar with that, you've been living in a cave. And also Tulane Blacktop as well. The original Torque Thrust wheels are a straight spoke design. In 1965, they came out with the Torque Thrust D, which is curved to clear disc brakes, which were now becoming standard and optional on a lot of uh, high performance cars. They still create both the Torque Thrust, the Torque Thrust D, and then also the Torque Thrust 2, which was originally a multi piece design. So there you have it, just a, a little history on ET wheels and American racing wheels, basically evolving around the five spokes. We aren't even going to talk about Kregers right now, but one day we'll sneak in a little bit of history on the Kregers. I know it's the favorite wheel of everybody out there, except for me. So thank you very much. Now back to your regular scheduled shenanigans. I think I remember putting these on, and I think I had almost as much money in the lug nuts and the washers as I did into the whole set of wheels. Probably not including the tires. One other thing to look for on any wheel, but especially aluminum wheel and especially Unilug wheel, is make sure it's not all wallered out where the uh, lug nut goes. And if you ever do put a fresh set of aluminum wheels on, torque them before you go out the door and then check them like 10 miles down the road, 50 miles, 100 miles, 500 miles, and then you should be good to go. But new aluminum wheels like to run loose. And there's a lot of really nice wheels out there that aren't so nice because the lug nuts got run loose, so always... Yeah, pull it off. Check that out if you're buying any wheels. Steel wheels, these old Ford steel wheels that are 100 years old, same deal, those things got run loose or somebody cranked them in too tight or that. You, you can't check to see if they're bent, 
by just eyeballing them if you're at a swap meet or in a junkyard, but you can check them out to see if they're wallered out. And if they're wallered out, unless it's a super rare wheel or you got some superpowers that I don't have, they're hard to fix. So your tech tip of the day. Right? It's a wheelie good one. Okay, no more dad jokes. So we got our wheel off. We're gonna probably, well, there's a little play in the wheel bearing there. I remember turning these or having them turned when I was in high school. But uh, that's the other thing with all this stuff is we got our 61 bubble top outside that is gonna need brakes at some point. So all this stuff should just go whoosh, unbolt from here and bolt onto that car. So that car could be roadworthy. Oh, the bushings are just completely gone up there. I thought we would see a lot more play and maybe it's in the other side. No, I can't feel anything there and sometimes that's the deal when you lower cars, ball joints are used to running at a certain you know, angle and then you lower the car and then it'll run at a different angle and they wear in a different spot and they wear funny and they wear out. I think Chin's pickup did the same thing. We lowered it, worked great, ran it for like a summer and then it wore this car, worked great for a couple summers and then that one ball joint went out. I've seen it a bunch of times and don't get me wrong, they probably would have done that with another year's worth of driving in the stock height, but just something to be forewarned. So this car will need an alignment when we're done. So I think now I'm gonna let the air out of the bags and then we'll split the tie rod ends and split the ball joints and then take our brake hose off, set this whole spindle and brake assembly off to the side. And like I said, that'll bolt right on pretty much any 58 to 64 full size Chevrolet X-Frame car and that'll be ready to go. And then we'll uh, take our control arms off. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, but we gotta get that air out of that bag because that's essentially a spring and uh, we don't want a spring or an airbag hitting us in the face. In a bigger <laughs> Ola Tiffany said, before you uh, go in, on all those brake lines and brake hoses and ball joints and all that, let's pull the master cylinder off so that way we're not leaking that entire reservoir of brake fluid down stream everywhere else so let's just take it off and then we can take that reservoir and go safely dispose of the contents in a environmentally safe manner greta how dare you speaking of environmentally safe contents this thing's got dot five brake fluid this is the only vehicle that has dot five when i put this thing together i don't remember who it was if it was my uncle or my dad, but they're like, you should put dot five in it. It doesn't attract condensation. And me being an impressionable 14 or 15 or 16 year old kid, I was like, yeah, you guys are the smartest people on earth. And not that it's a bad idea. This is the only vehicle that I have dot five in and you can't mix this stuff. And I don't know in 25 years, I've never had any issues, but also in 25 years, I've never had condensation or rust issues in any other brake system that I've had. That's been in use you know everything that sits gets bad so that being said i i feel like i'm fully committed to the dot five on this thing unless we change the rear brakes and, I, and i'm fine with it as long as it doesn't leak you never really have to add it but when we put the new stuff on we're gonna go to dot five so there you go that's my dot five rant but i think it's a pretty brilliant idea i always take the wheels off first the brake lines and stuff but let's take the master cylinder off and hopefully save ourselves a mess and not spill this on our nice shiny paint here. Another reason all my cars are hot garbage is because that way I don't feel bad leaning over the fender and working on them. But you know what we could put? Our Marchke Repair fender cover on this thing, but we won't. So we'll save those for you guys. Get your fender cover at mortski.com. All right, let's get a single reservoir fruit jar master cylinder off of this thing. That's the other upgrade we're getting here is we're going to a dual reservoir. So if we lose the rear brakes, we still have front brakes. If we lose the front brakes, we still have rear brakes. We're, we're with the single reservoir. If we lose any brake, we lose all the brake. All right, brake time's over. See what I did there? Ah, 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 ah. Gone forever, Aaron Hernandez. Gone forever, Aaron Hernandez. Oh, look at that, spill free. We're gonna dump this so I don't, I mean, dispose of this properly. Let's see if this master cylinder bolts right on. Sure does. That's one thing I was concerned about. 
seems how we're not going to be reusing the uh, brake booster that comes with the kit. One concern I do have is maybe that booster is different dimensionally than this and our kit came with pre-bent lines so we might have to modify those lines. Also, a lot of these master cylinders come with this slug that goes in the back and then it's got that o-ring that holds it in there and that is oh still got vacuum hooked up to it to uh take up the space for that rod so we're going to slide this in there oh no that sits makes it sit flush and you can see that that rod sticks out way past that surface so we are not going to need that slug so we're going to throw that on the shelf for another project but you'll also see that there's a hex here and then some splines here, you can hang onto the splines and turn that hex and adjust that in and out so that uh, as soon as you hit your pedal, you're hitting the master cylinder. But if this sticks out too far, if you slide your master on or your master doesn't butt up directly to your booster, if there's a gap in there, you need to tighten that nut up so that it's not putting pressure on it all the time. Otherwise you're gonna get brake drag and everything's gonna get hot and not happy. And don't ask me how I know. So check to make sure that you have this slug installed if you need it and you don't have it installed if you don't you'll definitely know if it's in there and you don't need it because your, your booster won't even slide up against the uh, face of the booster break things because i do breaks like every week it seems like like i talked about earlier you should probably paint this master cylinder but the booster is not painted my manifolds are rusty my inner fenders are rusty i don't care and I would rather have no paint and rust than a crappy paint job. And if I paint it, odds are pretty good it's going to be a crappy paint job. And if I spend all the time to do a good paint job, this project's going to take forever. And we don't want that. we got to get this thing running. Because the plan is to take this thing to the Lone Star Roundup the 19th and 20th of April. Come down and see myself and Puddin's Fab Shop and Slick and maybe, maybe... The infamous Unabomber Bill will be there. Uh, Sweet Patina is going to be there. Yeah, so it's a good time. Come on down, say hi, check out our merch, do all that good stuff. Lone Star Roundup, Austin, Texas, 19th and 20th of April. Look for the big rusty wagon if we get it done. Or we're going to lose the shop. Oh, we can't use the impact anymore. I guess we'll just bolt the single reservoir fruit jar back on. Thank heavens for ratcheting wrenches. I can't remember what it must have been like in the 1990s to not have these. Bench bleeding, that's overrated. Now, can we split the ball joints and tie rod ends, Duff? Well, thank you, sir, for your permission. We're also probably, you know what, while we're up here, sorry, Duff, we're not quite there yet. This line is was our only line. It's going to go down to a T. And then it's going to go from that T to this wheel, and then it's going to go over to that wheel, and then there's a T over there where it goes from that wheel to the back. So that's all going to change. So let's uh, go ahead and unhook as many connections as we can up here because that's all going to go away. And then it'll be ready to go down below. Ready to go down below. I'm going to pull it, and I didn't even know it. Where is our fittings at right there? Mm. Of course it's tight. Why wouldn't it be tight? Oh, got it. If we're really on a budget, we can put all these lines on the 61 bubble top. And the brackets and the clamps and the hoses. We can probably even put that extra booster we got on there. We'll see. Maybe we'll convert it, convert, convert it, convert it to dual reservoir while we're at it. Oh, there's some brake fluid. Oh, for cheese and rice. We'll put this line on there. So for those of you who aren't familiar, haven't torn a front end apart before. You got these castle nuts. There should be a cotter key through here, but uh, apparently 25 year younger me forget to put the cotter key in there and there. And of course I had to have all this stuff split to put these airbags in here. So sketchy. But anyway, take the cotter key out, take this castle nut off, and then you can either beat the crap out of it from the top or you can hit it right here and usually they'll split or you can put a pickle fork in there. So all depends on 
what you're saving, what you're trying to save, what you're not trying to save, what you don't care about, how angry you are that day, how big a hammer you own, so on and so forth. So let's get these castle nuts off of there and go from there. I feel like wailing on something today, so let's do this to, uh, the old fashioned way. No special tools required, just a BFH. So you can see how this is seated in there. This has got a taper, I think it's seven degrees. And that's got a taper built into it. There's a slight amount of interference. So when that gets pulled in there, it doesn't want to come out. So the uh, cotter key is just a fail safe, but sometimes they do come loose. Oh, we even hit it hard enough that the uh, top one came loose. Perfect. Whammy! Except we gotta get the bottom one though. Is there a cotter key in that one? Whew, there is. Lucky. Tech tip of the day, sometimes you can't get these cotter keys out. And if you don't really care about it, like you're putting new ball joints in, you can just take and put a socket over it or a wrench and spin it right out, right over the top of that uh, cotter key. I think that's what we're gonna do. It's just like that, no need to remove the cotter key. Let's thread this top one back on a little bit so that when we knock it loose from the bottom one, it doesn't fall on my toe or my head. It just doesn't fall in general. Now if we get our brake line undid from our brake hose, we should be able to lift this right off there. Ouch! Not the Cyclops. Cyclops, once again, proves infutile. Is that a word? Probably, but I'm probably using it wrong, but it sounds good. Proves infutile, once again. Oh no, it's still leaking fluid. We just gotta pull our clip off of our brake hose. Ouch. That was my elbow. Ouch, same elbow. Now, if we take our castle nut off, we got a whole wheel assembly. Yay. This airbag is bolted to the frame and also this lower control arm. Same deal with the shock. So we're just gonna take the bolts out at the bottom of the shock, take this bolts out of this bracket, which is integrated with the bump stop, which has seen better days. Take that all out. And then we got the uh, cross shaft back there to take apart. What are these shocks? Road sensing, the one. Lower control arm is loose. Now we got a couple of bolts here on the bottom. We'll take the whole thing off. So we just got this bolt here. And then these two bolts up here, I think those are a 7 16 bolt. And that is a, what is that? 9 16 5 eighths bolt. She's a big dog back there. So that's, so you can't get them on backwards unless you put that bar in backwards. Oh boy, that's what we'll end up doing. This is gonna be great. And this is why you buy loaded control arms or aftermarket tubular ones. So you don't have to deal with this one as a bonus. Oh, it didn't drop in the bucket. Lucky day. She's a season on the studded. Oh my. You have to get some heat, maybe a bar. Let's see if we can't coax her off there with the uh, air hammer. For cheese and rice. Well then, I guess we're getting the torch out. A little heat goes a long ways. Hmm. 
All right, one down, one to go. Let's take this tie rod off here. Oh, we're at it. See? Sounds good. So a tie rod ends. I should have bought the adjusting sleeve, but, and usually I do, because they're usually pretty dang affordable. And then you can assemble your new one next to your old one once you get your length right. So the here alignment is ballpark. But with these, I did not buy that adjuster sleeve because missed opportunity. Uh, but measure the disc between the grease circ, between your inside and outside. And then when you take it apart, write it down. And then when you take it apart, reassemble it, you get it to that length. And that'll get you within ballpark for your alignment. Another tech tip of the day. And the other thing is, only take one side apart at a time. So if you forgot which side of the tie rod was the inside versus the outside, or which way something went together, you can go reference the other side. Very smart. All right, let's get that upper control arm off. I think we gotta do that from the top, underneath the hood. Yes, yes. Very good. Not a lot of real estate in here, so I'm gonna show you what I gotta do. Here's this bolt. Well, it's kind of a stud, just like me. <laughs> we gotta take that nut off the stud, and then there's one right there that you can't see, and then we gotta sneak this whole thing off of there, so we either gotta move this steering gear, what do I count? Steering shaft out of the way. I don't know why the words have escaped my mind today, but you can see how bad the bushings are. Or they're pretty much not even present anymore out there. So we're gonna take those two loose, and then I do have a new rag joint to put down here, I believe. So it might be a good time to just take that loose. Either way, we'll figure it out. And I'm not gonna show you doing it because there's not enough room for the both of us. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. I just remembered one other thing. There's these little uh, shim packs in here. You're gonna wanna save those and probably put them back in unless you're immediately going for an alignment. I almost forgot how much fun these things are. I did go and look on the Rock Auto and they do not offer that cross shaft. And they're like 400 bucks and you gotta contact Napa first before ordering them. So that's why I didn't get any because they're uh, expensive and unobtainium. You can see she's been rubbing steel on steel there. So first thing we gotta do, take these guys off. I would recommend in your application, if you can get that shaft and it's reasonable, just do it. Cause then you can just cut it with a torch and get that out of the way. But we are gonna have to fight it the whole way because I'm cheap. You can see just how bad that bushing is, that whole backside is gone. And that's the other thing, is if this is damaged, this shaft, then you gotta order it anyway, so. But that's the inside of the bushing right there that was rubbing on the outside of the bushing. So it shouldn't be a problem for us that the shaft got damaged. So you gotta get that rubber out of there. Well, they make a tool for pressing these out. There's videos on that. I don't have the tool. I thought I did, but it's different than my regular ball joint tool. So we got to figure out how we're gonna do this. This is gonna be fun. Capital F U in fun. So that tool that I don't have that I was talking about is the same as a uh, ball joint press tool. These have bolt-in ball joints, luckily. But instead of going all the way around, it's just like a half moon shape to grab it. 
But like I said, I don't have that. I feel like Chin is the expert. I think he did this on his uh, square body. I haven't done one of these, I don't think. I think I was always smart enough to order the shafts when I did it. And to be honest, I haven't done a lot of front suspension overhauls. I just usually just run this stuff, as you can tell, and then it's worn out. It's lasted 25 years. Well, I'm sure this is all mostly OEM other than that ball joint, so it's got, it doesn't have that many miles. I want to say that car's only got like 70,000 miles. I feel like it's less than that. 75,000 maybe, I don't know. So, what are we gonna do here? Some guys will burn that rubber out. I think Chin drilled his out. And then once you get that loose, then you can maybe get this shaft out of there. Maybe, but I don't think so even then. Oh look, it walks back and forth. Ooh, we might have a chance. The bad news is, this is the worst one. So this is the one that's gonna come apart the easiest. And the other ones are gonna fight us. Well, maybe we'll figure it out. If I wasn't 100 miles away from the nearest major chain parts store, I would go there and get what we needed for tools. You suppose if we hit that with the air hammer, it'll walk out of there? Or we're gonna ruin something. We're gonna find out, that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna get some earplugs. I feel like we should be supporting this, but we're not very supportive. So, let's give her a whirl. Going straight to the big dog Astro Pneumatic. It's walking it right out. It looks like, anyway. go one side done and then you just slip that off over there and you can see that's the inside of that bushing so we'll have to get that off of there somehow now this side we should just be able to punch right out Mike Tyson style oh, Giggity. All right, now we just gotta grind the heads off these rivets, knock those out. We could clean that thing up and ready for reassembly. And then you can see how this is, it's not symmetrical. So make sure you put this freaking, freaking thing back in the right way. And uh, check for wear on these shafts. If you let it go too long, that control arm will wear into that. You might wanna clean those up on the wire wheel first. We gotta get that thing off there. How are we gonna do that? There we go. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Not really. Got our three rivet heads ground off. Now we're gonna take our smaller air hammer, knock them rivets out. Maybe. There you go. One worn out old ball joint. Ready to go in the trash. Now is when you would sandblast it and paint it if you were into that, but we're not. I thought about pressure washing it, but it's really not that dirty. So we won't be doing that. Run our shaft over the wire wheel. Clean that mating surface up a little bit. Just hanging out, hiding by the bead blaster. You gonna come over and do a little wire wheeling, are you? That a boy. That's what I like to see.
All right, now we'll grab some croil to aid in the assembly process and try to figure out how to get this thing uh, squeezed back together. Hopefully we get this in there the right way, otherwise colorful language may appear on this channel for the first time. All right, I'm pretty sure it goes like this because it's got that clearance clearance. Two, four. We have clearance clearance. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? For the steering shaft. We'll put a little looby dooby around there, a little looby dooby in there, and slide it all together. So, how are we gonna do this? Start with a little tap, tap, tap a -roo. Just tap it in. Just tap it in. Give it a little tappy. Tap, tap, tap a -roo. What's this? What is this? Oh, what's the right diameter? Let's really bash the threads up on this probably really expensive pipe to uh, barb brass fitting. All right. And throughout this process, you want to make sure this thing's moving. If it's bound up, you're going to have issues. You don't want to be bound up, you know what I'm saying? How are we going to do this? I think what we need to do is make a spacer that goes between there and there, and then we go to the press and push. If we don't have that spacer in there, it can push everything cattywampus. So we gotta have that spacer to keep that space the same. Yeah? Yeah. Duff, you wanna go round up a spacer? That'd be great. Needs to be about uh, 11 and 3 sixteenths. 11 and a quarter. Got that? Okay, I nibbled down this piece of two inch angle iron. Fits right in there. You might want to use zip ties or something to hold it in place while you're pressing it, but that'll keep these ears from spreading. Spreading? Oh, what's the opposite of spreading? Going in, because you don't want that. All right, I'm gonna round up some sockets to use to press these together, and we'll slam this thing home. All right, we're over here in my 20 ton central machinery press. We got a a pair of 35 and 36 millimeter sockets. Got ourselves some zippy ties. Let's try not to lose any fingers or eyeballs. I would recommend this as a two person job. Here goes nothing. Okay, now that one's tight. So hopefully this other one should go now. Once that gap closes up, we are done. There we go. That moves nice and free. We just gotta put our washers and our bolts in there. She should be good to go. Provided I put it together the wrong way, but I think that steering shaft has to go right there. Had to sacrifice four zip ties to hold that in there, but well worth it to be able to do this by myself. Wow, look at this. Moog sends us deformed locking nuts and lock washers. Yeah, definitely won't be using the lock washers. Oh, we're going to have to ream out the holes a bit. The rivet holes ain't quite big enough. Ream these out a bit with my favorite tool. So these ball joints actually drop in from the bottom as opposed to being on the top of the control arm. Why they did that, we may never know. Uh, it's probably part of, what is it, Moog call them their problem solver series or solutions or whatever, but Moog's always been pretty good about making improvements, making things better, continuous improvements and such and then they got this little i don't know cap washer whatever you want to call it that goes on the top side and we just got to torque these down put das boot over the bottom side and then put our uh grease circ in there look at that grease circ that is a heavy duty grease circ that's that's good stuff right there 
Again, these are made in the USA, so the good stuff. There you have it. Ready to put her back on the car. Oh, wait. We got to uh, put the end caps on. And then it'll be ready to go. There you have it. One freshly remanufactured upper control arm. Pretty straightforward. Nothing too crazy. Drill, grinder. The press is probably the biggest thing, but they do have a tool that you can do it and just uh, tighten them in place with a wrench. And you can get that from your local Advance or O'Reilly or Napa probably rents them out. I don't know. We don't have any of them around here. Let's turn that the direction it's supposed to be turned before we tighten them up. Boy, am I glad we didn't uh, sandblast and paint that. Did anybody catch what we did wrong? So Moog says, go to moogparts.com slash installation for install instructions. And there is none. And I was a little confused, per usual. We got this all screwed up. The ball joint goes from the top, like it always did. And this thing goes on the bottom and is supposed to hold the boot. Silliest thing I ever saw. So let's try this again. Ball joint goes in from the top. This metal washer thinger holds that lip of the boot. Don't drop it on the floor. No, oh, you're down there. Pick up the hardware you dropped. So you're supposed to Flip that boot through there so that it catches on that lip. I like it so. And then the bolts go from the bottom up. Now, if we snug these up, it should be correct. I apparently am not the only person who was slightly confused. I'm glad I looked because there's uh, some forums online. Looks like Moog has a missed opportunity to maybe include some instructions with the kit or when it says, for instructions, go to moogparts.com slash insulation. Maybe have some instructions. Now, she's ready to go back on the car. All right, let's do a lower. Now that we got done with the upper. Oh, she's sticky. The one video I watched said you're supposed to get them nice and loose. I don't know why. It makes sense. Maybe it'll slide off that shaft better. Who knows? This one, instead of bolts in the end, it's got nuts with the washers. No, not boots. Oh, I, I lied. They are bolts. Idiot! Idiot! But, you can see this one's got, I don't know, a double lip on the control arm. So, we don't have an area to smash against with our air hammer. So that is a pity right there, boys and girls. Doesn't mean it's gonna keep us from trying, however. I'm gonna put my gloves on. So we just gotta try to not mar it up too much. Woo. Let's get the big dog. Put some ear protection in. I don't know what model this thing is. Astro pneumatic. I've talked about it before, but this thing is an absolute unit. Wes got me hooked on it. Shout out to watching Wes work. And thank you for watching us work. Or whatever it is you call this. Jaw jacking with Mortski, if you will. All right, come on out of there now. Nope, just deep in there.
Oh yeah. Oh, that's the spot. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh, success. Six dollar screw up. Oh, could be worse. Could be outside working on a combine. You can't have it all. The lowers are much more miserable than the uppers, if you didn't get that from all that. We tried heating, we tried beating, we tried cutting. I think we're gonna have to do a little filing on the bores and the shaft to make this go all back together. But we're gonna do it. This is where it would really be handy to have a tool for pressing these out. Cause like I said, uh, you're not just dealing with one lip. You're dealing with two. The old double lip will get you, eh, Duff? I think we did all right. We'll just run a file through there. And then maybe run a file across the top of this. One of these got a little scratchy scratch on it. Oh, yeah, right there. Run a file over that. Have a sandwich, put her back together, let her cool down, eh? Yeah, those ones did not come out gracefully, did they, Duff? That was ugly, real ugly. All right, back to work. All right, similar contraption, same sockets. We had to cut a piece of angle iron, 12 inches this time. And we forgot to spray PB Blaster or Croil or some type of lubricant on there. So I'm gonna get this set in place and then I'm gonna go hit it with some blaster. Told you I would. Hopefully we got enough strokeage in our uh, cylinder here. I don't like the way that's lining up or not aligning. Move that over. Bound up. I just had to massage it to get her aligned a little bit there. No big deal. All right, we're flush up against the lower control arm. We just gotta put our bolts back in there, put our ball joint in, and we're done with one side. Lower control arm is done. Lower ball joint, pretty straightforward. There's two different bolts here. One of them's got a steering bump stop in it, and that's kind of what this is, so I put it on that side. It's probably wrong, but anyway, we'll find out later. I think these are ready to go back on the car. Now we just gotta do the same thing for all the stuff on the other side. And there you have it. Control arms reinstalled. I was gonna hook the shock back up. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be uh, looking for some shocks. The old road sensing is correct because you sense everything in the road. So I think we're gonna order something dimensionally instead of getting another one from Ride Tech because that one doesn't have many miles on it. Let's see if a spindle fits now. I sure hope it does. So there's a few ways you can skin a cat on the old uh, spindle action. You can keep your stock spindles and put disc brakes on them. Or you can buy aftermarket spindles set up for disc brakes. I prefer the latter. A lot of the uh, disc brake kits that just bolt on, use some flat bracket 
stuff and some terrible hardware and they space your wheels out. I'm not saying these aren't gonna space the wheels out, but I think we got a better chance. All right, speaking of better chances, I'm gonna have a better chance of getting that hooked up if I use a jack stand. Money in the bank. Yeah, snug those up. Beauty of these things is they're labeled LH for left hand and RH for right hand. So idiots like me can't get them on the wrong side, even if you can't figure out where your uh, tie rod ends are. They gotta be on the same ends as your steering is. Obviously. Just gonna snug them castle nuts up, throw our cotter keys in there, and then we're ready to hook up some steering. All right, now I'm gonna do what I told you I was gonna do earlier. Measure the distance between the grease zerks on the tie rod ends, and then we're gonna take it all apart because I'm cheap and didn't get the adjusting sleeve, which is usually like, sometimes I've got them for like three, four bucks. Usually in Rock Auto, they're 10 bucks, nine bucks and change, but no, I gotta go through this terrible, terrible, ceremonious disassembly of two tie rod ends and then thread it all back together again. And then I have two beautiful tie rod ends and a hideous adjuster in the middle. All to save $9 and change. Don't be like me. Buy the adjuster sleeve. What's it gonna be? I'm gonna say uh, 15 and 3 eighths. Oh, it would help with this one. Still had a greaser. Where the French did that go? Is there not even a hole? What? This thing was non-greasable? You're kidding me. You gotta be a zerk on this thing somewhere. Everything had a greaser in the 60s. Where did all this grease come from then? Oh, it's on the end. How dumb is that? All right, we're gonna go from the imaginary grease circ in the middle. What did I say, 15 threes? Stay still, way off, 19 and five eighths. Duff, write that down, 19 and five eighths. Let's go 19 and a half. We'll take a little bit of toe in. 19 and a half. Ugh, such a poor decision not to uh, Splurge on the adjuster sleeve. Well, maybe we'll get lucky and spray a bunch of squirrel pee on it and it'll go. I think I got a fancy socket thing that hooks in those. Just gotta find it. There. There it is, the OTC tie rod adjusting tool master set. Part number 6275. Fabrique in Taiwan. All righty. Alrighty then. So, these adjuster sleeves, one side is right hand thread and one side is left hand thread. So you get to play, it's a guessing game, which is my favorite. 50, 50, 90 rule. 50, 50 odds, 90% of the time, you're wrong. Come on, grab it. I said grab it. There we go. Who do we guess, right? Yes. These tools are so much nicer than using your old pipe wrench. It scars everything up. And if you really want to get scientific, you could count how many times it turns around, but that would depend on if your tie rod end was the same length as the old one and you were good at counting. Neither of which I'm very confident in at this point. Do, 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 do. Oh my word. Is this thing threaded like the whole way on? Yep, not a lot left. She looks about the same length. Perfect. Oh yeah, was I going to put squirrel piss on this? Before I took it apart? Probably. 
All right, this one wasn't so bad, but some of these things are a huge pain. Oh, and the new one's even got the Zerk on the end too. How neat is that? How neat is that? I would highly recommend replacing the adjuster sleeve. But that's just me. Uh-oh. Now she's getting taut. Urgh. give ourselves a whole lot to clamp to on this end. I don't see this ending well. So this side's gonna be left hand thread. So righty loosey, lefty tighty. We need 19 and 5 ace. Hoofta. We're just shy of 19. Nineteen and three eighths. Nineteen and a half. Good enough for the girls we go with. Let's spin some zerts in quick while we got her up here in the vice. Alright, ready to put her back on the car. member so that was when you drive your low stuff up and down gravel roads it's good for it what well, doesn't kill it only makes it stronger something like that all right we're ready for packing wheel bearings and throwing some rotors on and calipers and a brake hose we're pretty much wrapped up on this side ready to pack some wheel bearings yeah easy peasy lemon squeezy get those packed installed in our uh Rotors, wheel seals, for spindle nut on, dust cap, all that good stuff. And then we got our caliper. Napa Todd's should have us some shocks, he said. Brake hoses. We're uh, getting close over here, but check this bearing packer. There's a lot of ways to pack bearings. You can pack them by hand. You know, it's super messy, gross, nasty. And then they sell uh, these little I don't know it's like a canister you push down on and that's essentially what this thing is and then they have like uh, this I don't know nut that kind of screws together and then you grease it with grease gun that's what I always used before but Mojo had this thing brought her out here and this thing is the cat's pajamas it takes up a lot of space and you got to have like three tubes of grease to fill it but it is freaking sweet you just drop the uh, wheel bearing in there like so and this thing centers her up then you just push down on it until the grease whoop, comes right through there. Freaking sweet is that? I don't know who makes this thing. He brought it out. It was a dirty, greasy, grimy gopher gut. So he cleaned her up. Greasy, grimy gopher guts. And uh, I pitched in a couple of vats of wheel bearing grease. Here we go. This thing is awesome. I love awesome tools and old tools. But it's. Like I said, he had her all cleaned up and started to get dirty again, but it was a disaster before. This thing is freaking sweet. So I'm going to grease these up quick. And then he's got this little pie tin that he puts over it. And we wipe this off, and then we 
flip this around so it just kind of stashes away nice underneath there and then we keep our dirt out of our greasy area but old tools are super cool so i'm gonna do the other ones and then we'll uh go load up some rotors tech tip of the day make sure your bearings fit inside of your rotors and on your spindle before you fill them full of grease which i of course did not do This is like DD speed shop action here. This is this is Dan. What would Dan be doing with this much schmoo? This is like race car stuff. That's what they do. Pretty much anything. This is basically his life, schmooing stuff all over. But this instead of grease, it would be uh, RTV. We just drop our uh, inners in. Ooh, it fits. Hopefully, it fits the spindle. And then tap our seal into place. These are the chintziest wheel seals known to man. This thing suck. These slots aren't directional, so you don't have to worry about me putting them on backwards. Because 50 50 90 rule, I would do that. We might as well go ahead and knock them both together since we got the tools out here. Probably don't want a bunch of DD Speed Shop schmoo all over the so that it gets in your brand new brake pad. So we'll wipe that down. We just drop our outers in. And we're ready to go. Packing wheel bearings, probably Dan's favorite thing to do. Just schmoo everywhere. See if I can show this to you. We found our first uh, debacle. I think I ran into this on either that 63 or another one of these kits I did, but the cotter key goes through that pinhole right there. And that hole is too far ahead to catch in the nut. So either you need to space the nut out or you need a deeper nut. And that's why I'm glad that these guys didn't sponsor me this kit. Uh, Auto City Classics in Asante, Minnesota. I don't, they don't make this kit, they just sell it. But either way, if you're gonna sell something like this, make sure it's not a piece of crap. You know, you spend, I forget what this kit was. It wasn't cheap. A few hundred bucks, 700 bucks, something like that for spindles and brakes, all that good stuff. And if somebody was to just drop a cotter key in here and not know any better, this nut could spin quite a ways, run your wheel bearing loose. Ruin your spindle, ruin your bearings, ruin your rotor. Maybe wreck the car. So always check stuff like this and companies like Auto City Classic. Get with your suppliers and figure this out. So I gotta go see if I can find either a deeper castle nut or I guess we gotta put washers in there, which is kind of a hack thing to do. But or we could redrill the spindle, which we won't be doing because I don't feel safe doing that. Good thing I got a stash of castle nuts. So I grabbed a different one out of my collection and this one sticks out far enough so that it catches the cotter key. Bad news is I only got one of these so we're gonna have to use washers on the passenger side. Note to self, always keep an eye open for this kind of stuff. See if this dust cap fits any better. I've had a lot of issues with dust caps on trailers not being tight, especially aftermarket ones. And then of course they can make them too tight as well. So I guess we're gonna find out. 
tech tip of the day, use a big socket like this, and it doesn't mash up your nice new dust cap. Ow. Try not to hit your own fingers. Yeah, that one's a nice snug fit, so I don't think that's coming out of there. And like I said, the calipers might be seen through a set of torque thrusts or who knows what. So let's give them some duple color semi-gloss black because I don't have gloss black. Somebody used it all. Got our paint booth set up. Got the furnace blasting on us. It's basically powder coating. If it'll hold up to 15 or 500 degrees engine heat, should be good for like 3,000 on brakes, right? Yeah. Freaking brand new can of Duplicon won't spray now. As much as I want to stare into it and squeeze it, I won't do it for your entertainment value. Big spray can spray again. Alright, good enough for the girls we go with. So while we wait for those calipers to dry off, all we got to do pretty much is hook up the brake hose over there. We're going to go ahead and rip apart the other side. And it'll make my life a whole lot easier if I don't have to uh, carry a camera around and show you guys all that stuff. And plus the learning curve of doing one side is already done and I got the tools out. So it should go significantly faster. So if I see something in there that I learned or that I need to show you guys, I'll show you guys. But otherwise, I'm just going to bang out this passenger side. And Mojo's going to bang on. I think he's doing a Cadillac drive shaft carrier bearing something over there so we'll get this knocked out see you back in a little bit well there's maybe something we can address looks like we'll be repairing a shock bracket split right in half nice all right add that to the list of things to fix what happens when you drive your cars but at least this shock isn't shot maybe that's what saved it god how did that not make a bunch of noise all right now continuing to work in silence All right, put a new idler arm while we're at it and see this one's got a big offset and then it had a spacer in there. This one's got just a single offset instead of a double offset and they send their own spacer and they send new hardware and no instructions, but I think we got her figured out. So everything should be new up here. Get that upper control arm off and start rebuilding some control arms. All right, got our front end back together. Everything went pretty smooth. Got our calipers on. They definitely will not clear our 14 inch ET wheels. So we're gonna have to find a 15 inch or larger wheel option. So steelies it is. Next, we gotta do brake lines. So the single reservoir master cylinder goes from that single reservoir down to a T right here, where it tees off to this left front wheel, then goes over the right front wheel where there's a T and then it goes to the back. So the new kit comes with three new lines. So one line, well, we got our proportioning valve. We got two lines coming from the master cylinder to, to our proportioning valve, and then three lines from there. One goes straight to this wheel, another one goes to the other front wheel, and then there's one that goes from the proportioning valve over to that other wheel where the T used to be, and then taps onto that rear brake line and goes back. So, first thing we gotta do is get the old lines out, and then we replace them with these new lines that are hopefully bent up properly. One thing that I did notice is the Moog parts have, I don't know what they call them, they're, they're, they're a lock nut, but they're a steel lock nut. I don't know if you can see this one, but she is 
overly crimped. Like there's no way that a 516 fine thread bolt is gonna fit in that thing. So good thing we had those on hand. All right, Duff says get to work. He wants to go for an RID, don't you? Yeah, even though it's snowing this morning. So like I said, here's our new lines. Here's that short one that's going from the proportioning valve to the left front wheel. Here's our two longer ones that go from the proportioning valve over to the other side. One goes to the rear and one goes to the right front wheel. Let's get after it. Oh, and here's our proportioning valve and bracket and the lines that go from the master to the proportioning valve. Brake lines are all in and hooked up. Everything kind of laid out the way I wanted it to. Put a couple clamps down here on the cross member so that we can't move around so much. Next thing to address is this shock mount on the passenger side. Let's pull that thing out and see uh, the best way to repair that so that we got a functional shock. Let's use our screwed by Morski repair magnetic screwdriver slash pointer to get yours at Morski.com. You can see where it split right in there. And that's where the stress riser is at. You can see it's really beefy in here because you got all these bends and this weld up here. But obviously this is the least amount of material. You can see they kind of notched it out right there. Put a little relief in there to try to alleviate that stress. And if they would have had another bolt in here, I think it would have been all right. But just with one bolt, and then it's mounted to a, a non-flat surface. It's not a machine surface, so I'm guessing something relaxed or moved. And that caused it to break there, so. And the reason they did make it like this is just for simplicity. This is all one flat plate. This tab was up here, and this tab was over here, and they just bent it all over. So I think what we're going to do, first thing, is just grind this out. Weld it all up the way it was factory, and then either put a gusset over here or a gusset up here. This would probably be the strongest, this gusset up here. That's uh, gonna counteract the shock. So, let's get that fixed first, and then we'll see what we can round up for gusset material and brace that up. And we'll take a look at the driver's side, make sure that one's not doing the same thing. Putting a bevel on this parent material will give us all the uh, penetration. That's what you want when welding the penetration, full penetration. Welders get better penetration. All right, we're back to OEM. We could put this back on, but adding that heat in there, it's just gonna crack on either side of that weld, so we're gonna have to gusset it up. Let's uh, get it all gussied up, see what we can find. 
All right, snag this gusset out of our scrap pile. Ground her down, give her a nice bevel so we can burn it in good. Tacked it in place, went did a fit up, everything's good, so should be fine. So the way that that shock is acting and reacting is pushing up on this and pulling down on this. So it should beef it up quite a bit. Alright, we'll let that cool down, stick her back on there. We have eliminated that stress riser. Should be good for many years and many miles. There we go. Shock bracket in there. We just gotta get our new shocks. I don't know if we'll get those picked up before this video's gotta be out, so we'll just run these for now. But they're sitting at the Napa. We just gotta sneak down there and get them. So, let's go uh, put a track bar bushing in or two. Maybe. Hopefully not fail. Clean up that bushing mating surface. Pop the bushings out of the old one, slide this thing back together. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Hopefully I didn't speak too soon. So these new bushings are kind of a, I don't know what they're made, they're hard. And you can get them in different colors. So we chose black, polyurethane. It's uh, ain't got much give. Kind of confused me. That's the way they shipped it. And I thought, how is that going to fit in there? And then I took it apart. And so, yeah, I think we just got to press them in like this. Slide our sleeve through there. Should be good to go. Let's go press the old ones out. I don't know why that one decided to stick out that side. Nothing on this side. Should have stayed like this one. Who knows? We're just gonna go play whack-a-mole and get our socket back out of there and uh, put our new bushings in. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Right, wrong, or indifferent, but I've been uh, using these sockets to press things out. I just came up with this idea. Let's see if we can't get it out by spinning it. Oh my gosh, I am a genius. The smartest man alive! The old Stanley socket's none the wiser. Push our new polyurethane ones in there. One thing I don't like about these guys is they're prone to squeaking. So I'm sure you're supposed to use some type of special lube on there, but there we go. Super easy. So easy, even a caveman could do it. It's so easy, a caveman could do it. Not cool. I did a bada bing, a bada boom. One rebuilt track bar, ready to go. So what does a track bar do? Well, in a three link style suspension like this, the track bar keeps the sus suspension. The axle centered left to right. If you didn't have that thing, you'd go around a corner and the body would go that way and the rear end would stay there. In an application like this, where the ride height has been altered, I should probably have an adjustable track bar because I'm guessing this thing, the rear end, is probably going to be sitting off to the right. I think in an ideal situation, the track bar should be level at ride height. And in any vehicle that has a track bar style suspension, the more of a load you get on it, the rear end's going to be off because of the uh, arc of that track bar. The longer the track bar, the less movement. The shorter the track bar, the more movement because uh, of the arc and such. And an interesting thing that a lot of guys have done and found out, and I think even the, what, the O3 on up Crown Vicks, what was the last year, 11, have what they call a Watts link. And it's kind of the same thing, but way better. So in a Watts link suspension, it's basically got two track bars and a linkage in the middle and a pivot on the rear end. And that keeps the rear end centered 
at all heights in the suspension. So your worthless information for the day. All right, let's get this thing reinstalled. A little looby dooby on there for good measure. Well, maybe that's why that bushing is shot because it's not, they're not on the same plane. So it's always prying on that bushing. That's not so good. Well, let's just force it on. All right, that was kind of a cakewalk after everything else. We got a lot of new bushings in this thing. I probably should do bushings in the rear end here, and I should probably get an adjustable four link, but four link, track link track bar what have you oh yeah we gotta hook up that uh front sway bar should probably have a bigger sway bar should probably have a rear sway bar it is what it is all this stuff's good enough for the girls that we go with so they don't need no big fancy tubular control arms and 13 inch six piston calipers and all that stuff the old 6.4 is just a daily driver just go through my stash see what i got for mufflers i feel like i ordered some for this thing back in the day and the other thing is I think these are thrush turbos and for some reason I recall they weren't making them at that time But I feel like they make them now. So hopefully we can find something that just Bolts right on or we just keep running these so I'm gonna do a little dig and see what I can come up with Well, this is how long I've had them 2 16 of 15 <laughs> freaking eight years. No nine years So that's how long I've been running that thing like that. But yeah, these look like they should be a direct replacement. Two inch center inlet offset outlet. So these are accelerators, XS1224. I've been running these on a lot of my vehicles and had pretty good luck with them. They sound good. So let's spray a little looby dooby on some clamps. Thankfully, Tim down at Webster Auto Care clamped these on as opposed to welding them on like some shops do so this way we can hopefully replace them relatively painlessly i say that loosely because nothing is painless with exhaust all right let's rip into it see what we can do what kind of damage we can do anyway i guess we're gonna need a wrench for that one the good news is we got every single wrench in the whole toolbox out for this project. I was just going to mention we haven't even broke a bolt off yet, but stay tuned. That always happens with exhaust, right? This is exhaust. Oh, turn it sideways. Now I can use the impact. That one's hot. We got the smoking gun here. And we gotta figure out which kind of demolition device we're gonna use to get these apart. Did he put a little spot weld there? Yeah, that's okay. All right, in order to make room to get this muffler out of here, either this tailpipe's gotta come down or the head pipe's gotta come down. And I can't sneak the head pipe past the starter and the lower control arm after I already got the hardware loose, of course. So we're gonna come back here and there's a clamp or a hanger there and one back there. So we'll take those loose and hopefully we can slide that back far enough to get that muffler out of there. Of course, I gotta, Reassemble that hardware coming off the manifold first because I don't want all of it falling down on our heads <sighs> God dang it thought we were gonna have plenty of room there guess not
You're like a blister showing up when the work's done. Blister! Weren't burned yesterday. You weren't you weren't burned yesterday? No, I wasn't burned. Burn. Yesterday. Burn. Burned yesterday. I think the word you're looking for is born. Oh. All right, she slid into place. I'm gonna put the bolts back in the tailpipe and the hangers back there. And then we'll kind of get everything situated here, clamp her down. Maybe we'll even burn it back in place, seeing how that worked for close to 25 years. So everything went pretty good. It's a little tight, I meeting the frame here. So we'll have to you know, orient that so she ain't rubbing. We don't need another rattle. We're trying to get rid of the rattles. Just a smidgy clearance, just the way we like it. One more side to go. Or do we just put one in? I suppose we got all the tools out, we may as well do them both. Mufflers are back in place. Let's do a little body work on these exhaust tips. I am not a big exhaust tip fanatic. Big, ugly, chrome exhaust tips, trash cans sticking on your diesel. Bow tie shaped exhaust tips just ain't my jam. Just give me a nice clean chunk of aluminized exhaust pipe or stainless, whatever. Call it good. And I like these uh how timmy did these these uh i don't know what they call them baffle cut baloney cut angle cut hiding back here in the corner behind the bumper but i don't know from low spots or rocks or what she's pretty hammered out there so let's tap that out and then that one's caught something and this side's pretty bad so let's see if we can't straighten that out not like anybody sees it but i do speaking of uh body work I need to uh, patch up the spare tire area and I need to patch the spare tire because Looks like it let loose. I wonder where I had that parked when that happened because I bet there was some rust On the floor because I know it was a good tire I ran it for years without one in there and I think one year when we took it back to the 50s We decided to throw one in there Yeah I'm Not a sheet metal guy, so that should be fun, but Definitely gotta get a spare in there Hopefully it doesn't fall through. All right, let's do some body work. Much, much better. Back to the uh, original shape that they arrived in, circa probably 2001 or two. All right, on to the next project. All right, got the brakes all bled. A little combination of the old pressure bleeder. That thing is the cat's pajamas. I don't care what people think about vacuum bleeders, pressure bleeder. Real good. You don't need an air compressor to do it. And you don't have to listen to the hissing the whole time. But anyway, still I needed Chin to come in and back me up. And of course it didn't go well. So I had to bench bleed the master cylinder, which I don't think fixed it. And then I had to do some uh, adjusting underneath. So we had some more pedal throw down there and then I adjusted my brake light switch got all that done hey that's like literally the worst part about working on a car is laying underneath the dash and then they give you about this much room and your fingers are too fat and it's dark and you can only get one arm up there yeah under dash stuff no bueno but chin came in powered through helped me uh 
bleed them manually towards the end. So we got good brakes. Well, so he says, and then we never drove it. So just taking his word for it. And then I grabbed some multi-lug 15 by eights and a 275 60. This is the same thing that Puddin's running on the back of his 61 wagon. It's tight, but you can get a 275 60 in there. I had to lift up on that side of the rear end to get this wheel on. I don't have one on that side yet. I'll have to mount one up. And I'm not, I gotta buy two of them wheels for sure because so I can fit the uh, outside nub hubcaps on there. These got the uh, inside Titaruskis in there. So those are for like a baby moon style. So I either gotta buy two 15 by eights or I gotta buy something. And by something, I, I like, I like the five spoke. So uh, comment down below. Should we put Steely's with the uh, 68 Copo caps on it? Mojo's moving snow, so he's bringing the skid steer in. Or should we go some straight spoke torque thrust, 15 by eights and some sevens? Not really sure what I want to do yet. Duff, what do you think? We out moving snow with, with with the Mojo. So yeah, I think that's that's kind of where we're gonna wrap her up here. We can't go for a test drive. Let me show you. Like I said, Mojo is out moving the snow. Ooh, that is a clean OBS Ford. Isn't it? Isn't it? You're just wound up, ready to go. All the Hoover Schneef. Get the Hoover Schneef. Who's got the zoomies? What a crazy dog. Anybody want a dog? I'm not sure what he's on. Oh yeah, flag this week is nobody cares. Work harder. That's what we're doing. And then you're out here screwing around. But anyway, the roads are covered with salt and muck and nastiness. Man, you are fast. Who's a fast dog? Oh, I drove the Expedition earlier today. Look at all the salt stuck to the side of that thing. Yeah, so I'm not driving my wagon in the salt and getting that stuff all over it because that car's rusty enough the way it is. Yeah, this stuff is, it's not good. Not good, is it, Duff? So yeah, uh, no test drive, no, no RIDE for the Duff. Plus, he's all jacked up on Hoover Schneef. What is... What is wrong with you? This is pure snow! It's everywhere! Have you any idea what the street value of this mountain is? I wonder what the street value of this stuff is, Duff. Oh, yeah. Oh, it feels so good, doesn't it? You are something else. Such a majestic animal. I guess you want winter to stick around for a while, huh? Speaking of winter, uh, Lone Star Roundup. Plan to have this thing there. April 19th and 20th, Austin, Texas. We're gonna be there. We're gonna be slinging some merch. We're gonna be shaking babies and kissing hands. Anywho, yeah, come check us out. So there you have it. We got a uh, front end rebuilt on our wagon. We got drop spindles. We got disc brake upgrade. We got a sway bar end links. I don't know what else we did. Mufflers. Now we're gonna have some different wheels and tires because the uh, old ETs aren't gonna clear the disc brakes up front. So, thank you very much for watching. Check out our other videos, like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Remember, it doesn't matter you get it done as so long as you're having fun. Playing in the Hoover Schneef is fun for Duff. Not so fun for us anymore. I'm over winter. All right, on to the next one.
glad I could assist you. You know, in in tripling the amount of four inch or half inch drive extensions that you own. You know, I didn't come over here to have you mock me. Yeah. Ing. But I just yeah. knew what I was good at. Yeah. Mock. Yeah. Ing. Yeah. Bird. Hope you find your dad. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your dad. Thanks, Mr. Narwhal. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but you don't want to go with him, Duff. You don't want to go there. <laughs>